Over the last two decades, many discussions have addressed the prospects of aging population. Researchers have been trying uh, to capture some trends, uh, exploring multifaceted implications for states, governments, uh, citizens, societies, as well as uh, for individual sectors of economy and public policy. These implications are interesting not only from the cognitive points of view of demographic changes, but they express uh, crucial challenges for almost all areas of society's functioning. My name is Agnieszka Turska-Kawa and today I have a great opportunity to discuss some of those challenges with my distinguished guests, Professor Boglarka Koller from Ludovica University of Public Service in Budapest, Hungary. Welcome. Thank you very much for having and me. And Professor Christian Welzel from Leuphana University in Lüneburg, Germany. Welcome. Thanks for having me. For us political science researchers, uh, one of the most uh, interesting fields of under influence of demographic changes is electoral market. So I would like to discuss some challenges here in the electoral market with you. Classic studies compared to those demographic changes uh, create the space for new questions. And I know that the answer we will recognize in 20, maybe 30 years, maybe later. But let's try today to put forward some hypotheses or even some braver predictions. First, I would like to ask you about political communication. If we can predict, if, if we know that um, older people express weaker digital competences, how you, do you think that it will influence the political communication in the future? If I can start, uh, I think it's very important that, uh, that in each democracy uh, the electoral groups have to be targeted and if it's an aging population, uh, the older uh, voters also have to be targeted and they consume uh, sometimes very different media as the, the younger generations. So if we see, and of, of course this is just a kind of uh, prediction for the future mm -hmm. uh, the, about the, the communication channels, but uh, we see, for example, in some of the countries that, uh, that the elder generations uh, still consume the traditional media, like they, they, they watch television, uh, they read the local papers, because these, these are the channels through which they get the information. And this is very uh, different from the channels the young generation is using because they are more, uh, of course, taking uh, the information through the, the, the internet, social media, and even, even, even other channels. So they are not watching television, for example. And uh, if you would like to target all of these groups uh, at the same time, it can be very challenging for a political campaign because uh, uh, you have to watch your elder voters, but at the same time, uh, you have to see the, the and have to look at the youngsters as well. So what I, I foresee for the future is that you will have a more uh, diverse uh, communication pattern uh, because uh, uh, both of them have to be included if you are putting together your communication strategy. Chris? Well, um, one good thing about these demographic changes that we observe is that they do not happen from one day to the next. So these are very, very glacial, slow processes. So we have time mm -hmm. to uh, prepare ourselves uh, for what is happening and we should not fall into panic, uh, into crisis uh, mood. And But it's, of course, um, advisable to think ahead and already think about future changes and how we prepare ourselves for this. Um, one aspect I would emphasize is, um, and I will probably use this term a couple of times uh, while we are talking, is lifelong learning. We, um, the, the working environment will change quite radically, mm -hmm. uh, even in a shorter period of time, especially because of artificial intelligence. And it will force all of us, um, we will not just have education until we are the end of 20s and then we get one occupation and we have it until we retire. So people will be forced to update their skills more and more and again and again and again. And we have to get used to this. And we see this actually happening in the elderly population. One is the digital um, competence. Uh, if I look, for instance, into the German data 15 years ago, it was indeed still true that we had this um, gap between younger and older voter segments, the older ones not using digital media so much, but they are catching up. So um, digital media also go more and more into the, into the older population. 
you said that this is the longer process and we can prepare ourselves. But my question is, if we want to prepare ourselves for those pro processes, can you observe it? We're discussing it right now here. <laughs> you had uh, a project uh, on the gray voters, which is a, a final part here that mm -hmm. we are talking about it. So, of course, something apparently is, um, is, is indeed happening. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's a bit of a your yeah, first question was relating to how would a political communication and style of communication maybe change in the future. Um, one provocative thought I would throw into this round here is to say, we know the elder population have less testosterone in their blood, and we know that people with less testosterone are calmer and less impulse-driven and more sober and maybe even rational in their thinking. And that might mean if um, electoral campaigns are tailored, especially to the elderly population, our political debates might over time actually get a little bit less heated and more sober and rational. This is a very provocative idea. Okay, so I, I, not I so would, many I, fights in the public. Uh, yeah, maybe. I would question this actually, uh, and I, I think later we are we can we can discuss it if the elder population is 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 more rational than the than the than the young generation, because in in some respect, yes, I agree that maybe uh, the elder generation is going to insist on on more poli uh, policy outcomes and focus on that. Uh, but uh, I have doubts with regard to this. So there are a lot of irrationality also in the other generations. So when they are making their decisions and uh, how they vote, what kind of leaders they are selecting, uh, what kind of information they consume. So I don't think that is uh, necessarily dependent upon the, the, the age group, uh, mm. that rationality and irrationality. Um, because it sounds great that the, the, the youngs are the, the one who, who, who are uh, deciding upon their emotions and, uh, and uh, uh, if they can identify with the political leaders. But I think it's not always true, and mm. especially in Central and Eastern European region. So I wouldn't just uh, think about uh, elder generation choosing uh, older mm -hmm. leaders and, and, and always having uh, very conscious about policy decisions in healthcare and, and other issues. Because I think they, 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 they also emotionally related to, to, to the politicians, not only rationally. Okay. So I, I would, so I would, I would really uh, argue a little bit against this. <laughs> For you, so what is the main fundament of this irrationality? Sorry? What is the main fundament of this irrationality? Um, actually, um, and I think we are coming from different countries, so in, in Central Europe uh, and especially in Hungary, for example, it's very important uh, uh, that uh, that for all the voting groups to choose somebody who is who is uh, a guy from next door or somebody who with whom they can identify with and and age is not a most important component in this because even uh, it can happen that an elder generation uh, voter uh, votes for a, for a younger leader uh, because mm -hmm. they can still identify on the basis of uh, everyday habits and uh, what kind of clothing they have, how they relate to them. Uh, so there are other components than just age. So this is the irrationality that, uh, that they, they, they have to see themselves in their political leaders. Uh, so I, I think it's a very diverse group, uh, the elderly generation, and, and it's not so easy to make a, a, a generalized uh, uh, like prediction uh, mm -hmm. how they're going to behave. Well, when we talk about the future, it's, uh, it's speculation, of course, yes. but there is different scenarios we can think of. But uh, one thing I've, um, I believe is really clear, the elderly population that we are facing in 30 years is a very different one from the older people that we see today. For instance, um, there was, or today we see still certain gaps between younger and older people. Usually the younger people are the ones who are going to universities. The, the average level of education in the elderly population is lower. Mm -hmm. um, but this will change because the elderly population in the future will be a much more educated elderly population. And um, facing uh, rising life expectancies, also the health gap between younger and older people will also kind of close. People today at 70s are, are at the health status of people at 50s, like 30 years ago. 
So these are all. So we have not only to consider this, that, that the population is aging, but that the elderly population will also change. And again, um, lifelong learning. The older theories, Ron Engelhardt's mantra was uh, value change in a society can only happen through generational replacement. Because once people have um, done their formative phase of socialization, the value system has crystallized and stays stable, kind of frozen, you might say. And therefore, value change can only happen by younger generations replacing the elderly ones. We see now in our recent research that this is changing. People continue to change their values as they get older. So this will also be a more flexible population, cognitively speaking, than elderly people exactly of today. Okay, let's take this, but sorry, sorry to interrupt. But if yes, this is true that they are going to be a different population. So we have to look at now how is the young population today is. And if these, uh, this uh, generation, the youngs are turning away from politics, because uh, we can see from the research as well that they are not so much trusting the politicians and they, they are depoliticized in a way. So we can expect a generation and they are getting older. So mm -hmm. when they are going to be old, they are going to be, they're going to look for other channels than politics to, to represent their interest, if it's true. And I will, yeah. I would add to it, um, alienation. Yes. Because they are less and less interested yes. in politics. They are actually not less and less interested in the public. Uh, so how it could influence? Because if we can treat uh, the current younger generation as the future older generation with all of this background, we can say that uh, the politicization processes, for example, um, will increase. And then, for example, we can uh, look for some results of this, uh, not only in the public, in the society, but also in the, uh, on the political scene among actors. Because they are not interested, um, alienated citizens are not or uh, less and less interested in uh, professionals, more in people who will be closer to them. Do you see this threat? We don't know. I think it's uh, as the others uh, and my, as my colleagues also told that uh, that yes, uh, there is a double trend. So yes, they can be alienated, uh, but at the same time uh, they can turn to 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 other other channels like the civil society organizations, for example. So they will uh, maybe there is going to be again uh, a kind of era when the civil society organizations are going to be very very important. Uh, in our region, I think we have to uh, take into consideration this because uh, um, well, there are always changes, how important are there. So I think that that can be one kind of uh, route mm -hmm. they are going to take. Yeah, I mean, political interest is in many ways a cyclical thing. We know this from life course research. Yes. People are mostly interested in politics when they are in the mid years of their life cycle because this is the age where we are most um, are demanded for in terms of uh, career responsibilities and responsibilities in the family. So those people are in the mid-career phase, you have the most burdens to carry and therefore you are more um, engaged in, in the community. However, we also know that this mid-career is also shifting upwards mm -hmm. as life expectancy is increasing. So we have a lot of um, changes also in life course then which phase starts when mm -hmm. and which um, ends when. And also with the younger generations, we had this phenomenon also in other countries, especially after um, the 68 uh, flower power revolution, because that generation, the baby boomers, um, and before were extremely politicized. And then you usually have in the next generation a counter reaction to this, and then we had a generation X, and those people were actually stereotyped as, as very unpolitical, back into the private sphere, hedonism, and then you get a new generation Y, and they are again mm -hmm. more political. So this also follows certain cycles, and it's hard mm -hmm. to predict how it will look like in uh, 20, 25 years from now. Mm -hmm. I mean, what you said, civil society is, of course, important. And the um, aging population might actually um, increase in um, civil society for one reason we will have to rethink um, our concept of paid work. Many countries, um, especially on the left, um, discuss now um, unconditional basic income. When artificial intelligence increases our work so much that the productivity uh, skyrockets, that means that fewer and fewer working population can finance 
um, the rest of the society. It's economically perfectly possible, but that will mean that many people are out of work and we have to think of how we remunerate parenting, um, volunteering, and that's Caring. the contribution yeah, yeah, to yeah, civil yeah, society, yeah, yeah, yeah. and volunteering and community work. Mm -hmm, yeah? mm -hmm. This could actually be something that strengthens civil society. I, I and then, of course, uh, the whole demographic issue of aging population opens all doors for the migration issue because uh, in order to sustain the population with uh, fertility rates in many countries way below 2.0, uh, you can sustain the population and feed the labor market only through controlled and regulated migration. I absolutely agree with this. So we have to take the economic aspect into consideration that in order to to maintain a, a kind of European way of life, it's, it's how the European Union puts it, uh, more the, it's in the interest of the elderly population to to have uh, uh, the young generation financing uh, financing them actually. So it is, uh, and that's why I I, I, I argued at the beginning that uh, if uh, politicians or governments would like to suit to this kind of very diverse uh, task, uh, that at the same time they have to target with messages the the elder generation, but I also have to be attractive to the young. Uh, generation mm -hmm. because there is an economic background to it that these are going to be the people who are financing uh, the, the the elder generation who lives longer longer and longer now we have to rethink generational contract yes, we have to we have to rethink this what about the risk horizon because even if we are talking um, if, we, if we talk if we are talking about economy uh, and economic choices, uh, you can think about the difference between the younger and older generation, for example, um, as a fundament of risk horizon, yes, because the older generation would like to feel safer. This is my guess. Um, more secure for the younger, if the perspective is uh, longer and longer, they can risk how it can influence the economy. If just uh, if uh, as an economist, I can, I can say that uh, there is no uh, no choice for the government in this respect, because at the end, uh, it's about the so the, the the states have to perform well in economy in order to finance uh, these policy areas. So there is no choice in this because uh, the whole Europe, the, the one of the first priority is the, the competitiveness. So in that respect, uh, if we just talk about mm -hmm. the policy choices, uh, there is no choice uh, to, and, and we see a lot of uh, problems with stability and favoring stability. So if I, if I remain in Europe, I think, uh, 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 what we are going to see in the in the next decade is going to uh, be the priority prioritization of uh, competitiveness and make uh, all these uh, policy areas competitive and if we look at this there is no other choice because uh, mm -hmm. uh, because these uh, these sectors have to be financed and if there is no money it's it's it's, it's not the interest of any of the strength of the society so pure economic rationality counts in this respect Okay. Absolutely, and we also have to rethink uh, intergenerational justice concepts. We need them because indeed the younger population and the elderly population have slightly different interests. We have this discussion right now also in my country where there is a proposal by the government, um, Social Democrats, Liberal and Greens, to reform um, the pension system. Um, and it is proposed that the um, contributions that are paid should get higher so we can keep pensions that are paid right now at uh, a stable level. But there's also a lot of resistance because it's said the younger generation is burdened too much. And these are things we really have to thoroughly rethink. Mm -hmm. Chris, you mentioned um, life cycles. Uh, if we can agree that uh, during the different per periods of our life we are interested in different areas, topics, and it's obvious and, and natural, um, how it could influence political campaigns? Because for, ex for sure politicians would like to get to target, catch um, the largest segments of voters. If it w elderly people will be, a segment will be larger and larger, they would like to focus on mm -hmm. themes that they are interested in, just to include them in the, in the narration. Yeah, it will be definitely be true. I think that is for sure that um, 
the interests and the preferences of the elderly population will weigh heavier in electoral campaigns, as you said, because this is a large um, voter segment and increasing. Mm -hmm. However, they cannot um, ignore the younger people because they will, will be the one who are in paid work and will fund basically the society. And therefore, they may be sort of shrinking in terms of the proportion of the population in this group, but their economic weight will be yes. will be greater. So politicians have to strike a balance between this. And then we will see how we organize in migration into our economies and how this made, makes the shrinkage of the younger population segments not so dramatic. Mm -hmm. This is the task for smart politicians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thinking uh, in the perspective, yes, so, so the yeah. whole background. Uh, what about the values? Do you think that it will change? I mean, the values that we are dis that are discussed in the public. Mm -hmm. This is the same, actually, very close to the uh, electoral mm -hmm. themes. Uh, if we can focus, um, if we emphasize um, values that um, have the target, yes, the, the people, how it could influence the election? Because uh, it could be more conservative, more focus on um, family in Poland, on religious aspects, than education or, or professionals. Hard to say, because from a more classic point of view that was held in sociology and political science, you might assume that value change over the generations will decelerate, become slower, because older population is growing. Mm -hmm. And stereotypically, we would say older population is also more conservative and doesn't change their mindsets as strongly. And that would mean, if we stick to this assumption, that value change would slow down. And that could also mean that many positive, progressive things like the rise of emancipative values, which we have observed in Western societies over the last three, four decades, would also slow down. And that could create problems. However, as I said before, newer research shows that these assumptions are no longer that valid because even elderly people are starting to develop more flexible mindsets and showing also progressive value change. So it happens in the individual through the life course. From this perspective, value change does not necessarily mm -hmm. have to become slower simply because the elderly population is growing. But this is, um, and if emancipatory value change continues, usually we would argue this helps the left rather than the right. But this has never happened in the past. The um, center-left parties have not profited from a rise of emancipative and liberal values, even though these are the values that they represent, because the dividing line where the frontier is between left and right with every generation is moving somewhere else. So the frontier is moving, and therefore the left is not necessarily profiting from a progressive value trend, even though when mm -hmm. these are d d closer to their ideology. So therefore, um, it's hard to say whether either the left or the right is um, taking benefit from, from this long-term mm -hmm. trend. Yeah, I would, uh, I absolutely agree, but I would add that um, uh, since the constant change of the, the channels uh, through which the political message is going through, uh, it can happen very easily that, uh, for example, some of the progressive uh, values like sustainability, the green myth of Europe and everything comes up in one time and then in other, like in another decade, mm. it goes down. This is what we have seen, for example, at the European parliamentary elections, that it was much more supported by the young generation. And even within a very short time, it can change. So it goes actually a little bit uh, against the slowing down of the change because uh, it can happen. Uh, even the, if we, we, we cannot even talk about uh, social media in general terms. Uh, 
uh, because some of the channels are, uh, and sorry to what I would quote some of my family members who are from the young generation, that they are telling us that, uh, okay, Facebook is now for, for, uh, for the older people because we don't use this channel. But if you look back like uh, 10 years ago, it was regarded as, as one of the, the main thing uh, or main, main component of social media. So we can also foresee like a, a widening of all these channels and, and through them, uh, these messages uh, can be delivered easier, faster, so it can be changed uh, uh, faster, um, the, the, the values of the, these generations. So we don't know, actually. But I think there is going to be a, a cyclical thing in some mm. of these, uh, these, these mm -hmm. values. Not so sure, because um, when we look into our data, the value changes are very glacial. And you don't see strong fluctuations in values. And mm -hmm. I would not relate fluctuations in electoral outcomes uh, and relate them back mm -hmm. uh, to, to value change. Value change is uh, way too slow mm -hmm. to uh, be able to explain such mm -hmm. short-term fluctuations that we have in electoral outcomes. So, for instance, um, when uh, we had the European Parliament elections in 2019, yeah, yeah, yeah. this was everyone was fearing a landslide uh, to the cent uh, to the right-wing populist parties, and it didn't happen in 2019. The Green parties the were Green, the, were yes. the big winner of those elections. Four years later, so in the recent European Parliament elections, the landslide to the right-wing populists mm -hmm. did happen. And the Greens lost a yes, lot. That's what I and this is a very mm -hmm. short-term electoral outcome change that has that is hard to explain. With, uh, the values did not change in that short amount of time so dramatically that it could explain mm -hmm. this. These are issued uh, um, cycles. The issues are changing, the topics that are salient in a, in a certain mm -hmm, electoral mm -hmm. campaign. In 2019, it was climate change. Mm -hmm. And the Green Party was profiting from, from this mm -hmm, a lot. Mm -hmm. In the last election, it was migration. And when, we, when migration is salient, the right is mm -hmm. profiting. And when climate change is salient, the left will be profiting. Mm -hmm. And this will going yeah, back and forth. Yes, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, and uh, Chris knows more about this. But I, I'm, very, uh, I'm, very, I'm very curious this because uh, uh, what we have seen around this green green campaigning and many people in, in, in various countries, in Germany as well, in Hungary, young people went to the street protesting and really, really... Fridays for Future. Yes, and, yes, yes. Mm. And now we don't see this uh, spirit so much. Uh, I don't know if you see it in your country. Uh, and. Um, and yes, uh, it is just it was very short time, and I I, I agree that it's it's not value change, but more the mm -hmm. uh, the, the the issue is is, is changed. But uh, we couldn't. I, I was not imagining that it's changing so fast mm -hmm. uh, uh, within sh such a short period of time. Yeah, Fridays for Future yes. certainly has lost a little bit yes. of its wind. Yes, yes, yes. So the wind energy. Is, it's yeah, no longer yeah, yeah. that obvious. Also, has a little bit to do with uh, media attention cycles, yes. which are sometimes so dramatic. You all remember uh, three, four years back, Corona, 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 corona nothing, yeah, else. nothing else. And then came the Ukraine war. Yes. And that is now a number three because now everyone reports about Gaza and West yes, Bank. Yes. So it's constantly going back and mm -hmm, forth. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's difficult to predict because mm. we we'll live in a polycrisis era where one crisis is overlapped with the other ones. I so. mean, events that are not predictable will also decide which topic is salient for the moment. If we mm -hmm. have, a, I don't know, some major natural disaster or a, a, which a, we don't a, want to have a basic, a basic, <laughs> uh, a, a super dry summer and a, a, a cat catastrophic misharvest, yeah, then climate change is more important. If we get another refugee crisis or another uh, pandemic. mass terrorist attack, um, the topics will shift again. So, mm -hmm. and this is mm -hmm. hardly to predict. Yes. Okay. So let's not do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's switch to the political scene. Um, we are talking about the society. We are talking about themes, values, but what about changes in the political scene? I mean, about uh, politicians. Do you think that uh, political choices could change? You had some doubts about age as a heuristic. Mm -hmm. I think that it could work, yes, because if you find a similarity between persons who are in, at the similar age, you can um, easily predict or think that you can predict um, this person's behaviors, values, and you are safer, you feel safer. 
Mm -hmm. So yes, I, I had some doubts because I think it's uh, like it has many components, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I I uh, I don't think that uh, that uh, somebody a water from an elder generation is necessarily going to vote for 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 somebody who is from the same age. I don't think so because other components, other elements like the the culture, uh, the uh, the way they they behave, uh, if they find this kind of mirror effect that they mm -hmm. look the same, they do the same, they eat the same, uh, what they are doing, at least currently, because I, I don't know what is going to happen in the future, but it counts a lot to, 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 to vote for these, these, these leaders. And, uh, and age is not so important in this respect. Uh, what is more important is that uh, they can identify with this. So this identity component is, is, is very important, at least in Hungary, uh, that they are choosing the people uh, according to the leaders, according to this kind of calculation. So identity so counts. So personalization process. Personalization very much, mm -hmm. very much. Yeah, I would add that this depends also a little bit on the um, electoral system that you have in a in a country. Like majoritarian systems and presidential systems have um, a higher degree of personalization than uh, proportional representation parliamentary yes. democracy. So this is also a factor to be taken into consideration. And I would see these personalization effects much stronger in the presidential and majoritarian yes, systems. I, I, I also agree mm -hmm. with this. Okay, thank you. So the last question. Um, are you afraid of those changes? Do you see some threats uh, in them or we can just treat them as a change? This is a good one. I would see it as a challenge, but one that can be coped with and mastered if we just think about it ahead of time. A lot of it has to do with what we make of artificial intelligence because mm -hmm. This is probably a, a, a bifurcation in our history of humankind where AI will become the biggest gra uh, game changer probably in what we have ever experienced, even bigger than the Industrial Revolution. And our work concepts and work en environment will probably completely revamped. And it's up to us to build institutions and I would go here with Harari, um, mechanisms of self-control or self-correction, mechanisms of self-correction. AI is also not infallible. And we have to think of mechanisms that there, is, that there are self-correcting tools. And that's also important for politics and also a reason why developments when right-wing populists come to the power, what they are doing is to cut off the self-correcting mechanisms. Press, mm -hmm. judiciary mm -hmm. system, you know it better than I know by your own observation. Um, but this is very clear and this undermines um, democracy because democracy is not just about majority rule but separation of power and that means self-correcting mechanisms. No one is infallible and the populist idea is a little bit driven by this illusion that there is a leader who represents the will of the people and therefore is to be followed because he, usually a he, is infallible. And that's an illusion or a myth. Yes, uh, I agree that uh, we will have a lot of job as political scientists to, to, to analyze what is happening because we are, we are there, we are in this next industrial revolution kind of new thing. And I agree that it's much bigger. We don't see the consequences. Uh, and I also, I, I would like to uh, link my, my thought to it. I'm not afraid of the change, but what we really have to do is to prepare for that. And uh, one way of preparing for that is to, to, uh, to, to educate the people uh, how democracy works and, and why is it important and to really have it from a, from a, from a younger age to, to, to make democracy sexy for the young generation, to, mm -hmm. to enjoy that how, how good it is to, to get together with others and determine your own affairs and to be active. And uh, maybe it sounds uh, uh, a little bit uh, boring for some of the uh, elder generation individuals, but, but we have to work on it to, to bring uh, democracy education uh, more into schools and, 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 and really uh, educate people how to have this 
correction mechanism or 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 a belief that that it's important because we cannot rely on AI uh, and uh, uh, and I agree. So we have a, a kind of responsibility if we, if we take it to the philosophical level to to really emphasize it and and bring it more to to schools to high schools and to universities as well and this goes only to active citizenship so if you are active so if you are doing things projects something to not individually but also not not I like the, I, actually I like the terminology you used and it's actually the next book title make democracy sexy again yes make yeah. it sexy <laughs> together <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. It was my pleasure to, to have you here to discuss this uh, very important, uh, very important topic. And I, yeah, we put on the plate many um, important questions without the answer, I think now. And I would really like to see that this uh, table with you in 10, 20 years and just to verify our answer. So this is the invitation. You can treat it as this and hopefully we can, uh, we can do it in the future. Thank you.